you mentioned writer's block and meeting at like a writer's block um a workshop do you believe in writer's block is that something that you put merit to or do you think it's more of a myth um I don't think it's mythical, but I don't think it's always a block either. Uh, I've also heard people talk about writer's reluctance. Mm -hmm. uh, I know a lot of writers who avoid writing. Um, and there are pretty good reasons for that when you think of how writing can be such hard work and also sometimes painful mm -hmm. in terms of kind of the emotional journey it puts the writer on. And that emotional journey is often different than the one the reader goes on when they read the resulting book. So we're not talking about, you know, you can see the writer's journey in, in, the, in the book itself. So the writer sometimes has to go through personal things to get stuff in print. And sometimes those can, can create a lot of reluctance. I think that there are, there are kinds of blocks where writers work against themselves subconsciously or consciously. Um, there are blocks that are caused by self-censorship. There are blocks that are caused by poor self-esteem. You know, someone has told them that they didn't have the right to do this. And so they're always pushing against that through their, often their whole writing career. Um, but, but writer's block is never just one thing. Mm -hmm. Like it's the thing that, it's the resistance that writers face. And because the end result is sometimes less writing or no writing, then it gets called one name. Mm -hmm. But if you're a writer and you're struggling with getting work onto the page or onto the screen or whatever, you're always going to have an individual struggle. It's never going to be exactly like someone else's. Now, we, we as writers often huddle together for warmth and we share those things we feel in common. And there's enough commonalities that we have conversations about it. But, you know, if, if you're a writer who's feeling blocked and, and you go to the internet and you look up writer's block, you're going to find 2,200 or 2,000 pieces of writing about it. And some of them are going to resonate with you and some of them you're just going to go, you know, the eye roll will be full body, right? Because it's like, oh, no, seriously, that's not <laughs> relevant to me at all. Um, so... It is a thing, and, and it isn't a thing, if that makes sense. It is a thing. Writers are prevented from writing by things that happen in their own psyche, absolutely. Um, but how you, what it is or how you fix it is very, very much an individual thing. And, you know, I teach a lot of writing classes, and I try to teach a technique to people of recognizing your own blocks and figuring out how how to subvert them or how to get around them or even just how to avoid them. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I have a bad habit of avoiding writing because, you know, it's hard, it's whatever. So over the years, I've learned that I will have several pieces of writing on the go at once and I'll avoid one with another. I so like if I'm that. not ready to work on that, that thing, um, I'll work on this other thing. And to some degree, this mystery novel that just came out is an example of that because I was working on what I refer to as a great looming serious novel, right, which um, is still looming out there. My agent has it and is shopping it around. But, um, but I, you know, I realized that life itself was throwing some curves and the novel was serious and had very kind of difficult narrative voice and I didn't actually feel like being in the dark place in my writing and in the world. Mm -hmm. So I had this other thing which I had begun, uh, actually I'd begun to try for a three day novel uh, weekend. Nora Abercrombie and I won the three day novel contest in 1986 <laughs> and uh, it was a fascinating way to create what was basically the outline of a good novel. Luckily, we were allowed to, to edit it, and we felt that we had to edit it in a proportionate amount of time. So we gave ourselves a certain number of hours to do our revisions, and, and then we, we felt we were done. But um, 
but it was it was a useful way to get a novel out into the world. So I thought oh, I'm going to try that again. Unfortunately, life intervened, and one of my parents went in hospital, and, and so I just had this little thing that I had started one evening. And so at this point of avoiding the tough writing, I thought, well, why don't I just you know do that some like write write uh, write on or work on that piece some, and that turned out to be a brilliant idea. And in fact, it turned into three not three books in a series, um, but. I looked at them more as if they were freelance writing than as if they were, um, uh, you know, knitted out of the fabric of my intestines or whatever, you know, the really tough kind of writing that, that takes a lot out of you emotionally. And so even though they have some fairly serious themes, uh, the writing of them was, was therapeutic and recreational to a large degree, which meant I allowed myself to put in lots of jokes and to to, you know, just completely fly by the seat of my pants, which was great, great fun. And it reminded me that writing can be really fun. And like my own particular version of writer's block or writer's reluctance is when I set myself a task that's really hard and then I'm in the middle of it and I'm thinking, oh, this is too hard. I want to have a nap, you know? <laughs> so I needed reminding that, that there was a reason why I did this. And so these books kind of reminded me me. And at the same time, I also went back to my visual arts and started painting. And that was another thing that reminded me about the joy of creating stuff. And I think that at certain times in our lives, we have to figure out, each one of us individually as writers, have to figure out ways to work around barriers, some of which were set by others and some of which were set by ourselves. And uh, and if we can do it through other kinds of writing, that's great. You know, that's a, and certainly that's what I did. And it's turning out to, to pay off quite quite delightfully. The, this book apparently is really charming people. Um, I've had a starred reviewed in Publishers Weekly, which has got to be a thing that we can cheer about because that's, exciting. that's very rare. Starred review! <laughs> <laughs> um, and the German and the UK rights have already sold book even came up. Oh, wow. So, again, very exciting because that means I've earned an advance from the publisher before uh, before the book even starts to sell domestically, which is the best possible situation to be in, let me tell you. Well, congratulations. So That's I'm, very I'm, exciting. I'm, yeah, I'm really happy. You can, you can probably see me grinning. Um, <laughs> really, I'm really delighted by that. But it, it's, you know, it's the culmination of a, a lot of decades of mm -hmm. being a writer and working hard so maybe it's not as surprising as i find it but one can always hope that there's going to be a little money in it yeah. <laughs> which hasn't been the case in you know i mean one doesn't go into writing to make money most of the time no we uh a lot of <laughs> our members know that that's for sure um speaking of yeah. writing or sorry of money and publishing do you have any wisdom on traditional publishing versus self-publishing? Have you ever self-published? Do you have friends who have self-published? I have not. Yes, I, I have friends and protégés who self-published. I haven't yet, but I do have the rights back to uh, a couple of my books, and I've considered that concept, but, well, I'm not going to say but yet. I've considered that concept. I haven't got to it yet. Mm-hmm. Traditional publishing is how is, is how I how my career developed, right? Uh, uh, how I grew up, and and it's what I'm an expert in in some level. And self publishing is a whole new learning curve, and so far, haven't really wanted to do more than understand how it works. In other mm -hmm. words, I haven't wanted to actually do it and put have the hands on learning. But um, the thing about <laughs> all right. Uh, Put on your seatbelt because this is one of <laughs> my rants. The thing about the difference between self-publishing and and uh, traditional publishing, if you look at it from a from a, if you will, an ideological viewpoint, is that traditional publishing had the had the choke point, the point of of quality uh, of uh, quality assurance at the point of the editor. Hmm. So the editors of the press set out the kinds of books they wanted to publish and 
they established a set of standards and you had to meet those standards. So you had to go through this, this narrow, this narrow choke point, right? So a lot of people submitted only a few grains of sand got through the, the, the neck of the, of the hourglass kind of thing. Um, when, a re when a reader went to those presses, they knew what, what the press had set out to publish. Mm -hmm. So they knew what they were getting. So, in fact, there were presses that, that I actually subscribed to. Like a magazine where, you know, every year they would send you their entire list and send you a bill. Um, and it was an, an interesting small publishing model. We actually tried to do that at the Books Collective and, and did it to some extent. But by then there were a lot of um, industry elements that kind of messed us up. But that's beside the point. The point being that you knew what you were getting. And when you went into the bookstore, there were all the books. They were published by publishers who had a set of standards and a point of view. And then the bookstores also acted as kind of filters. And so the clerks would guide you. They knew their, they knew their books and they would guide you to the books, the new books that had come in from a certain publisher. If you said to them, I want a book about such and such, they knew who was doing that. They took you to the shelf. Um, you had a, a roadmap through the the wilderness of who's writing what. Um, it wasn't a perfect system and it did filter out some good work, but it also meant that the reader wasn't the filter point. Mm -hmm. And now what we have is a situation where the publishing the promotion, the marketing, and the distribution have been devolved onto the individual writer. Mm -hmm. And the decision-making in terms of quality control has been devolved onto the individual reader. Mm -hmm. Now, you could think of that as a kind of freedom, or you could think of it as hell. And, and there's really a continuum. But really, do you know what you're getting automatically when you, when you go out in the self-publishing world and pick a book? No. And one of the things that happens if you look on your Kobo reader or an Amazon is there are two sets of price points. Mm -hmm. The traditional publishers are setting price points that are lower than the point for the book, but they're still high. So for instance, for my book, a hard copy costs $19.95 in Canada. And the ebook I think, costs $11.99. Which is a decent price point for a you know a Kobo whatever, but on the other side there are books that cost between ninety nine cents and about say eight ninety nine at the highest, but usually sort of five ninety nine. Those are often the self published books. The difference in the price I think is in part because the self publishers understand that they can't they can't um, expect the reader to automatically buy all their work and they know that the price point has to be set so that they can taste test the books mm -hmm. so that they can say, Oh, I'll buy this 99 cent loss leader for crystal ball and see if I like crystal balls writing or, you know, here's an anthology by Rhonda Parrish. Um, I'll check to see if I like the stories that she chooses as an editor. And all of these, all of these systems have, have downsides, but as a person who, who like most other writers, I also have to earn a living. I don't make my money out of writing. And I remember Krista Ball, who does make a lot, make a lot of her income out of writing, telling me that her best year, she made $30,000. So we're not talking big money, but we're talking sort of, enough to create a, a skinny little income stream and that's doing all the work herself wow so so in addition to writing she has to do all the other things all the promotion all the social media all the stuff that a traditional publisher would do for you mm -hmm. now people will look at a traditional publisher and say yeah but you only get 10 percent of the money well yeah but on the other hand they do all the work 
mm-hmm. all the work. You know, you just have to show up with your manuscript. Obviously, they want you to help them promote it. And the more you do that, the better you sell and the better things are. But the reality is you can be a, a reclusive writer like Salinger and show up with the manuscript, have it, have it accepted, and then you can go back and close the door of your tiny cave and the publisher does all the work, mm-hmm. right? Um, these days, more and more, they want us to help out, obviously, because it's dog-eat-dog world there which is different than a doggy dog world, which is what I have here. And they start working, I, apologize. I have the um, same problem. <laughs> so, so in self publishing, everything is on the author mm-hmm. and secondarily the reader. And if you see this as freedom and you have the time and the energy and you're willing to do that work, you can accomplish amazing things. Look for an example at Cory Doctorow who has worked in both traditional publishing and other. um, And he, I believe that the person he imitated in this was Howard Rheingold, who was one of the early kind of computer world, like digital world theorists and and was part of the well and so on. And and Rheingold would publish every chapter of a book he wrote before it was actually published as as a book by the traditional publisher and still sell two or 300,000 copies. So when Corey started writing, he's very much a copyleft guy, and his writings on copyright have become quite famous and, in fact, uh, get used by me in print culture studies to discuss the question. Um, he looked at that and he thought, nothing, everything I do is going to be open source. So you can, you know, when he writes a new book, you can actually read the chapters on his website. But then Tor, who is his publisher at the moment, will publish the finished book because they know that he's created a readership. But not all self-published writers can can start a magazine called Boing Boing and can <laughs> can be, you know, brilliant commentators on the digital world and et cetera. So most most self-published writers have a modest amount of resource to bring to the table in terms of how to get the book out in the world and so on. So if you're willing to do that, you have the energy, you have the resources to do it, and you're willing to put up with the problems, um, then you can actually have a good self-publishing career. Now, the third category I should mention of self-publishers is the people who get their rights back. Because there is this thing called the midlist writer, of which many of the people I've mentioned and I are one, who are not the best sellers who, who have their books on the stands in the grocery store under the 10 bestsellers list or whatever. They're not, they're not the, the 10 or 20 or 50 big names. They're the writers that people read the rest of the time after they finish reading the Lee Charles child thriller or the new Minette Walters or whatever there. And this is called the mid list. And many mid list writers have discovered in the past few years that the midlist is shrinking and there's a lot of pressure. So it's hard to get your books in print if you're a midlist writer, and it's hard to keep them in print. So a lot of us have the rights of early successful books back. The, the, the presses have taken them out of print, and that means the rights revert to us. We then have to choose what we're going to do with that. That book still, there's still a demand for books, those books. Do we actually get into some kind of self publishing setup? Or do we find another press who's willing to bring them out again or what? And I, I went through this, um, probably my best known book is called Black Wine. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a sort of fantasy slash science fictional future, possibly novel. Um, hard to describe because it's also very literary. Um, but it made quite a splash. Tor kept it in print for some time, but eventually... Sales went down, and they they uh, agreed when I got the rights back. So then, a small publisher called Five Rivers brought the book out, mostly as an ebook, but also there was a print version if uh, through print on demand. But Five Rivers has just gone out of business. Mm-hmm. So now I have the rights back, and I have a, an EPUB file that I ha- could access if I wanted, and I have to decide what I'm going to do as as a, a midlist writer who still gets people asking me. Is, is black wine available? 
So am I going to self-publish it and have it sort of passively on my website? That's definitely an option. And a lot of writers have, have faced this and have decided to self-publish backlist, including some big names like Stephen King. Um, and Cory Doctorow brought out his most recent book himself because he was absolutely opposed to, to DRM, digital rights management, on the manuscript. And his, his options in distribution were quite limited. So it's a long story, and you can find it on his website. But the point being that people make those decisions in order to get the books out, uh, some of which have already been written and had one life in a traditional publishing stream. And they're now on what's called the tail. And in self-publishing, the tail is, is infinitely long. So it's often good once you've, you've, you've gotten the, the results from traditional publishing, you keep that thing in print somehow in a self-publishing way, and you take advantage of that tiny but infinitely long tail. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if, if my answer really comes down on one side or the other. I, I truly believe in the gatekeeping function of traditional publishing, and I really love physical books. Mm -hmm. I love them. I love the way they smell. I love the way they look. I have a lot of them in my house, which you can't really see because of the angle of the, <laughs> of the uh, camera. But this whole wall over here is books. And back through that doorway, there's an another room full of books. And people come in my house. And it's very funny. Have you read all these books? No, I just bought them by the yard. Yes, of course, <laughs> I read them. Um, but, um, so I love that. But I also love my reader. I love being able to, you know, hold a very light little Kobo reader in my hands when I'm reading in bed or when I have my feet up on the couch, and uh, you know, I don't, I don't have to hold this heavy book. And for many books, we read them as entertainment. We don't need to own them in a physical copy to have had the core experience. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I kind of feel like the McDonald breakfast sandwich version book. That's the book that I can read on my reader. And mm -hmm. the, you know, gourmet, beautiful, extremely uh, elegant edition kind of book, that's the book I'll have on my shelf. So as a consumer, I like both kinds of books. But I also admit that as a consumer, um, I've read a lot of self-published books that I considered bad writing. And some of them I even read because friends or protégés published them. And I will never, ever tell them what I think. And I will never mention the names of the books I'm talking about because I think that's unfair and mean and unprofessional, but they exist and they're out there. And I have spent valuable time um, in my life reading them. Uh, I have a friend, <laughs> friend who came out of Eyes Wide Shut, the movie, and turned around and said to the rest of the people that he'd gone with, well, there's two hours and 47 minutes of my life that I'll be begging for on my deathbed. <laughs> and uh, um, and that's sort of the, the phrase that I think of sometimes. If I read a particularly bad book for reasons, whatever they may be, um, I sometimes think, oh, on my deathbed, I'll be wishing I had read some something a little better for those hours. Um, but as I said, because I read fast, I'm actually willing to take far more risks. person who reads really slowly, I think, really needs to be careful about what they read and really needs to seek out the best possible version. You know, and this is a segue too, but people tell me they, they don't like reading mysteries. But one, one of my friends who's a, a walking buddy, we, have, we walk every, every uh, Wednesday, um, well, usually we walk to the Vietnamese restaurant, but you know, whatever. <laughs> um, and, um, and she's sort of like, oh, I never read mysteries, but I'll read yours. And then she comes and she says, oh, your book's tremendous. I mean, the characters and they're doing this and these themes and whatever. And I kind of look at her and I'm thinking, there are lots and lots of mysteries that are like that. You just haven't read them. And your idea of mysteries solidified maybe somewhere not somewhere in, you know, 1968 and, um, as post-Agatha Christie and, and you're thinking of a kind of pulp literature that is, is no fun and no good to read and you don't want to waste your time. But I bet I could show her 10 books 
like tomorrow, I could show her 10 books that she would love to read, that would have all the elements that she loves in a literary novel that were mysteries. So, you know, so she's right. If she's a slow reader, she's right to limit her reading. But at the same time, um, she's limiting herself from reading some really good material too. So, so you know, if, if if you care if you care about what you read, absolutely don't read crap. And how do you decide whether it's crap or not? That's the hard part, right? It used to be that a publisher decided for you, and you knew you could go to Penguin, and any Penguin book you read would not be crap. Mm -hmm. uh, but now there's the Penguin books, and then there's a hundred thousand self-published titles beside them. Yeah, and you have to make the choice. You know? so it's hard. It's hard. People, I know that. Yeah, I think the same thing can be said for a lot of genres. You know, romance for one is a very, it's a genre very close to me, and it's a very saturated one that you have to kind of use your own discretion, or you are going to be reading things that aren't necessarily worth your valuable time in the end. But at the am same I, time, am there's... I allowed to use minor profanity oh, in absolutely. this recording? Yes. <laughs> well, Theodore Sturgeon, who was a famous science fiction writer, was once asked quite confrontedly why 95% of science fiction was shit. And he said 95% of everything is shit. And you know, that's become known as Sturgeon's Law, although sometimes people say crap instead of shit. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's that question of how do you do your filtering, mm -hmm. right? And and you have to filter out the crap. And, and a good reader comes to a, a set of filters that they're satisfied with. You know, some people like story, and then they don't much care how the story is written. And so they're willing to read a Dan Brown, Da Vinci Code novel, even though he's really a terrible writer. As a writer, he's a terrible writer. But people people seem to like his storytelling, right? And so they see it different. They see style as different from story. Mm -hmm. I can't separate the two, so I can't bear to read a badly written book because I'm not drawn through it. Like, the, the story is impeded by the bad writing. But, you know, people make their filters in different ways, and thank goodness they do, because it's a big world with lots of writers in it, as you pointed out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're, we're in this interesting experiment of universal literacy that means that more and more people can write and think they can. And so that means more and more books. So that also means new and interesting ways to filter out the good ones, I guess. That's very true. That's a very good point. I should get back to some of the questions that yes. are from our members instead of my own questions, because I could talk about my own questions about publishing and such for years. Um, one of the questions that we were asked to ask you was, how do you sort of keep track of things when you're writing a mystery? How do you keep everything in order? Do you plan? Oh, such or are you a pantser who just flies by the seat of their pants and hopes that everything ends out perfectly? Well, I'm sort of a pantser. Um, I deliberately actually set out with, with this book, The Adventures of Isabel. I set out to write a thing that I started typing at the beginning and I continued typing till the end. And because I had started it out as a three-day novel, what I learned when Nora and I did that was that you, you have to get into the story right away. Mm -hmm. So I dropped in, you know, so and so's been murdered right away. But I had I didn't sit there planning the plot. So so and again, because I was doing it for recreation and treating it a bit like freelance in the sense of not becoming too precious about what words were on the page. I didn't feel bad about that. I just felt, well, this is going to be fun. So I would sit down and, for instance, I thought of a list of clues. Like, what what could happen to create a list of clues? So I had the, the dead person had mailed an envelope to herself. <laughs> and in it were all the clues. 
which is one of the you know standard tropes of, of mystery. And there it was. And, and then I just thought of a number of things. I had no idea what the num- what the things were, but they were all things that could open doors. You know, little packages of white powder, pretty obvious. Um, you know, crumpled crumpled used paper cup, also obvious because you could get DNA out of it, or you could test the residue of what had been in it, or you could look at where the cup came from. You know, so um, and I didn't do this in any kind of sort of heavy. I've got a plot way, and so I just kind of kept going. But what what you find, especially in more experienced writers, is that they seem to have, or we, we seem to have, what I think of as the voice in the back, you know, the the team in the back of my subconscious that is a, that is creating story. And when I talk about this in my writing classes, I remind people that We talk about intuition, but all intuition really is, is the sum total of everything we've known and experienced to date that gives us an idea about, in essence, the trends in reality. So it gives us a way of guessing about what might happen next, or it gives us a kind of a spidey sense about what could happen. So there's a writer's version of that as well. So by just sort of flying by the seat of my pants, I was actually just throwing my fate into the hands of, of, of my subconscious storyteller, if you will. So as things developed in the book, they would, they would hook in, like I'd be writing something just outrageous and then realize that it kind of hooked in and that if that was the case, then this other thing could happen next. And I, I literally did type it in order. There wasn't a single section of that first book that I moved around. Later in the second book, I actually broke my rule after the first draft and in the third book I'm breaking my rule in a bigger way because I realized that I had to move the beginning stuff around so that I could keep going on the end stuff with something to work on but um but it was kind of fun and what was even more fun was to realize that my trust in my inner writer had actually completely been borne out because when I came to the end and I realized we were done here. Um, the last few scenes were so much fun to write because I realized I had given myself purely unconsciously all the material I needed to wrap the story up. So I think that our storytelling experience can be, we can rely on it far more than we think. So, you know, I don't really think of, think I am writing by the seat of my pants. I'm just writing by decades of experience and decades of story of, of absorbing stories and understanding how story works um, but the other thing I think I was operating on was here's how mysteries work here are the elements in mysteries and luckily I'd had a chance to kind of spy on the police a little bit over <laughs> the years when I was on the, the liaison committee um, and I've actually been to some workshops where police have said this is what's right and this is what's wrong about mystery novels and t- and mystery TV and so on, um, which are a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> you learn things like you know nobody ever burps the ambulance they call it. Um, you know in in a TV show they'll put the perpetrator in the police car and then they'll close the door and then they'll slap the the top of the car two times and the driver drives away or they'll close the ambulance and then they'll bang two times on the door drives away the first responders just laugh and laugh at that they call it burping the ambulance and they say it's never done right so you learn things that you know are never done but if you i mean all my life i've been reading mysteries so i kind of know what's supposed to happen so i get to actually make fun of what's supposed to happen or make the thing happen depending on how i feel at that moment or sometimes both Um, and I think that's another thing about, you know, an, a writer is also an experienced reader Mm -hmm. and you've got to get out of your own way and let what you know about the writing come out. And if you're, if you don't know enough yet, then read more books. Seriously. Like sometimes the solution to a writing problem is to just read a lot of books. And so 
having read a lot of books in my life, I now have this big backlog of kind of instructional material, if you will. Mm-hmm. Except it's not directly a lesson. It's like, here's what this reader did. Here was here's what Iris Murdoch did. Here's what Sarah Smith did. Here's what Lori R. King did. Here's what um what's that guy's name that wrote the Elvis uh Elvis Cole books. Uh can't remember his name, but you know, here's what all these different here's what Dick Francis did, here's what Agatha Christie did. And you have that all in your head and it gives you some certainty as you're steering your course. Um I I truly admire writers who plot incredibly intricate mystery novels. Mine aren't mine aren't plotted that way and I don't think I'm promising the reader that kind of experience. You know, I'm promising a story about some people to whom things are happening that that need solutions. You know, whereas John Le Carré, brilliant writer, just brilliant. And you listen to him read out loud and you realize that on the level of the sentence, his stories are watertight, airtight, they're perfect. But they're all about, you know, here's the spies and the secret intrigues of the spies and who's the mole in the circus and, and whatever. And I, you know, every time I read one of his books, I just pull my feet in and so that I'm not, I don't even have my feet on the pedals and hold on and just go. I, I have no idea what's happening half the time, but <laughs> the book itself is such a great journey that, you know, when it gets to the end and so-and-so turns out to have been the mole, I'm, I'm not going, oh, of course, that makes sense of all the 27 million intricate plotting moments. I'm going, oh, oh okay, cool, right. You know, but the journey was worth it. Mm-hmm. So so um, I'm never going to be that kind of writer, I don't think. Although, you know, when you say never, stuff happens too. But, um, but I, think, I think drama grows out of what people do in their daily lives. So to put people into daily lives where they're hit with these challenges is enough for me as a writer to to uh, to create mystery, to create suspense, to create um, challenges, to create injustices that must be righted, which of course is the big thing about mystery novels. They're, they're moral fictions. They're about right versus wrong, mm-hmm. justice versus injustice, and so on. Anyway. That's interesting. Next question. Um... As someone who also kind of writes by the seat of her pants, I appreciate that. So I'm not doing it completely wrong. Um, so, well, as I say to my students, there is no wrong way to write except not writing. That's when very you true. No, you want to be. That's very true. Um, Can I use every, that as an excuse every, next time I have a paper due? Is it, <laughs> hmm? Can I use that as an excuse next time I have an assignment due? I would rather be writing, and it's uh, wrong not to write. <laughs> I got to say that some of my early short stories or earlier short stories um, grew entirely out of avoiding freelance deadlines. I had everything mustered to write the article. And instead, I spent you know this amount of time typing a short story. But the positive side of that is then afterward, you go back to the task you were assigned and, and your head is fresh, like the stream has flowed through it, and mm-hmm. then all of the research would fall into place, and I'd write it, and probably I would have spent the same amount of time stubbornly sitting in front of the, the typewriter or the computer trying to force the article, but instead I divided my time into pre-writing that cleared my head and um, having the subconscious put the article together so that I could just type it back. So there is a certain tiny limited justification for what you just said. <laughs> I'm gonna hold just on to that. <laughs> make sure that make sure that it doesn't then become the excuse for non performance completely. But that's think true. of it as how you clear your mind or how you move because that's another joy of avoiding one kind of right thing with another, right? You freshen your mind and you take it out of that rut. And when you go back everything looks new and fresh. Mm-hmm. So there there are there are precedents for for that just be careful precedents and excuses are two different things <laughs> that's very true <laughs>